بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. We begin by mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa taala and we ask Allah to send His peace and His blessings upon His Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I would like to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for your attendance tonight. Jazakum Allahu khairan. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa taala just like how we are gathered here today for Allah to gather us in a much better place in Jannah with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If us as human beings, we genuinely appreciate when you spend a night learning about Allah. That's how our thank you is. Jazakallah khair, I appreciate it. Things of that sort. How much will Allah appreciate your sacrifices? When Allah knows what you could have done instead of coming here, yes or no? You had so many options, yet you chose to be here. I ask Allah to continue choosing you and never substituting you. Abadan, Amir Rabbil Alameen. So with this being said, brothers and sisters, entering, entering into our last session, talking about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and reflections from his life in Mecca. Last time we spoke, and I'll give you a quick recap, the Prophet sallallahu came as mercy to all beings. Typically, when prophets, they come, they come to specific society, specific city, specific tribe, or so on and so forth. But the one who comes for all people is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi We have not sent you except mercy to all beings, not just the human beings, but also the jinn, not just the jinn, but also to the animals, to the trees, to the earth itself, his mercy to all beings. And not just that, Rasulullah sallallahu a very important point for all of us. Allah in the Quran says that he was sent kafatan linnas. To all people, so his message is applicable to every part of Google Earth. Are you guys with me? It's not applicable only to Mecca 1400 years ago and now it expired, it needs to be changed. No, a'udhu billah. It's applied to every location and every time until the day of judgment. May Allah allow us to submit to the commands of Allah and his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So as the Prophet conveyed the message of mercy and so on, Typically, you have very evil people in the leadership position that will do whatever it takes to block it, to stop it, to silence it. May Allah keep us strong. I mean, so when the Prophet ﷺ was unable to push back, when he was unable to help his companions, they were suffering right before his eyes. Allah revealed and the Prophet advised, what is it? It's time to go to Abyssinia. Go to Abyssinia, which is known as the land of Ethiopia. The Prophet ﷺ said, there is a king. His name is an najashi He's known to be Christian, but he's known as well to be among the most just and fair people on earth. The Prophet promised, no one in his presence will ever be oppressed. Allahu Akbar. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said that. And the Muslims, they gathered and they went group by group, very secretly. The Quraysh should not know because if they get caught, they'll be beaten to death. The Prophet then said, you go under the leadership of Ja'far bin Abi Talib. Who's Ja'far bin Abi Talib? Who is he? Related to the Prophet. His cousin, right? Ja'far is the son of Abu Talib. Abu Talib, if it was not for Allah, and then Abu Talib, the Prophet would have seen much more pain, yes or no? So why in the world is Jafar going? Abu Talib is protecting his nephew Muhammad, so for sure he can protect his son Jafar, yes or no? So Jafar is going there making a statement. I'm willing to sacrifice everything in the whole world to be with the weak of my, among my brothers and sisters, Allahu Akbar. There are weak men and women Going, I'm going to join you. Not just that, when I go to Abyssinia and the An Najashi sees me, he knows this is serious. Jafar from the elite tribe is coming to Abyssinia. There's a case behind this. And as they go and before they leave, Allah reveals a chapter. Which chapter does Allah reveal before they go to Abyssinia? Surat, which chapter? Number 19, Surat Maryam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals chapter Maryam. Why? You need education about the people you'll be living amongst. They are people of Christianity. You gotta learn what Islam says about it. So the effort you and I should put in general is what does Islam says about this? That's your primary source of knowledge. Are you guys with me? 
you want to advance, you want to become an expert, then yes, you may want to read the Bible and so on and so forth, just to educate yourself because you talk much to them. But step one is not to read the Bible, to talk to a Christian group of Christians or read whatever book for a group of Jews or whatever book for Buddhists. No, no. What does Allah says first? Are you guys with me? You start with that and that's enough. You wish to progress because of whatever reason, may Allah bless you, may Allah make you means of guidance. Say Ameen. So when Jafar bin Abi Talib, this happened, he went, guess what happened brothers and sisters? Quraysh noticed. The number of Muslims are decreasing. What's happening? They get very angry. What's going on? And the news spread so fast. The Muslims escaped. The Muslims flew. The fled, where? To the ocean. And then what? Sailed on boats. And then what? They went all the way to Abyssinia. They got so, so angry. What happened next? The Quraysh wants the Muslims back. To leave them alone, they left. Why you want them back? Isn't what they were irritating you? Now they're gone, alhamdulillah, for free. You didn't pay anything. No, but that's something for us to learn in general. When there's people of that level of evil, may Allah make them few and may Allah guide them. I mean, they tend to have so much hate to the truth that they will go out of their way to stop it. They left, no. Just like some people, maybe nowadays, a country or whatever location it may be. There's so many problems in the world. So many problems in their country. But the thing they focus on is something of an Islamic ruling. It's abusive to its people. Let's stop it. Out of the whole world, that's the thing you want to win your elections based on? Something to criticize Islam? Yes or no? So this trend, what Quraysh is doing, is doing, happening till this day. And they call it under the banner of freedom, under the banner of liberty. Countries, they have symbols of what liberty or symbols of freedom and they go rob the freedom of other people in faraway land. Yes or no? This is false advertisement. So the people of Quraysh, they do whatever it takes and they make a plan. Ready? Ready to the plan? Focus with me. They said, we will buy special gifts high-end stuff only found in Mecca which what, what kind of gifts leather products fantastic stuff like your Louis Vuitton or whatever Fendi and Gucci everything is Gucci inshallah so then we move on then you get all that stuff okay do we just send it like that no we send with the gifts the highest end caliber young men Amr bin al-As is one of them you go and this is the step step one you present the gifts to who? To the advisors of the king first. Then you try to tell them why you're here. And you try to tell them, hook it up. Step two, you talk to the king directly. You start by giving him the gifts. Then you explain why you're here. And you want these losers back. And make sure, make sure you do whatever it takes for the king not to hear what the Muslims have to say. Why did they stress on this point? Because they know if the Muslims had a platform to speak, a platform of educated, scholarly level Muslims to present Islam, they know this will destroy falsehood. They know it. That is why the people of Quraysh back in Mecca, when the Prophet recited Quran, what did they say? Raise your voices. Yell, yell, yell out loud. Why? So the people do not get to hear the Quran. Why? Because you will what? You'll lose. Allahu Akbar. May Allah return us back to the Quran. I don't want to go into conspiracy theory and stuff like that. But they might hint why the Arabic language is on and that going downhill. But inshallah there's also good signs. Even the Arab amongst us, with all due respect, I sat with many and many. May Allah guide us all. They cannot read a page from the Quran, yes or no? La la, this is an exaggeration. They can't read a word from the Quran, yes or no? May Allah forgive us and return us back to the Quran. And we also have people that read the Quran cover to cover, but they don't apply a verse, no. They don't even apply a word from the Quran. So we need to be able to read and we need to be able to apply. May Allah grant it to all of you here, Amin. You got the plan? Got it. Amr bin al the team, all the gifts, yalla. And they go. Sail on the boat, arrive to Abyssinia. 
right when they get there, what was step one? Go to who first? Go to the advisors, right? Hey, what's up? Hey, here you go. Here's the purse, bro. High-end stuff. Only in Mecca, bro. Just for you. Khalas? Hook it up. And usually, when things like that are out of the, out of the norm, you want something, right? Everyone, kul batriq, every advisor, that's the title, was given something. After they were done passing the gifts, there's something followed. Listen, you guys. I want two things from you. Number one, I want you guys to hook it up. We came here to talk to the king. Why? There's a bunch of losers, foolish, little kids. Shuf. Look at the language, huh? Till this day, that's the language used. Bunch of backwards people. Bunch of people who came from third world countries. Huh? They came to your land. They left the religion of their forefathers. And they did not even join your religion, which is what? Christianity. And they came, these losers, with a religion unheard of, innovative, out of this world. So we want to bring them back to Mecca. Understand? We want to bring them back to Mecca. And the leaders of Mecca are the ones that sent us to you. So please, when we talk to the king, after done with you, give us like, mm-hmm, yeah, that's what's up. Give us some, you know, hype it up a little bit. Number two, do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes for the Muslims not to be able to speak. You see that stress again? Number two, second level of stress. Then when they come to the king and Najashi, what happened? They go to the king and they go and they prostrate, full prostration. And that's how they greeted one another. That's their salam. Salam and then sajda. So they came, he says, oh king, here you go, some gifts, high end stuff, back and forth. I appreciate it. And Najashi accepted. Then they said, oh king, we are here to seek your assistance. Why? A group of foolish little kids left Mecca, came to your land. They left the religion of their forefathers. They did not even join your religion. They joined some weird stuff, some weird practices and stuff like that we've never heard before. So their leaders, their parents, their high-end tribe position people asked us to bring these little kids all the way back. The advisors, ready? Yes, sadaqu ya malik. O king, they have said the truth. Just like the today people that we have, right? They have said the truth, O king. Their people know them more than all of us. So we strongly advise you, O king, return these foolish Muslims or foolish people back with these people of Quraysh back to Mecca. Do you want to cut it? Do you don't want to hear from the Muslims? What happened? And Najashi got very, very angry. Why? He got incredibly angry. He said, how in the world do you want me to return a group of people who sought refuge in my land, accepted me as their ruler when they had all different options on earth? They came to me. You want me to return them back to you without hearing from them first? I'm lost. Oh my God, it's over. Right? Advisors there. Is this refundable? Not refundable. Gifts are here. It's, you, you didn't plan pretty well. I don't know, okay? He shook, shaken. Then he said, the king, if what you said was true, foolish, corrupted, messed up people, they have to be held accountable back in Mecca, I will surrender them to you. I will assist you with shipping, me, shipping them back, deporting them to Mecca. If they were not what you said, then I won't make you even touch them. Fair enough? Fair. Now, I want you to appreciate, you just moved, uh, not a new house, that you're so nervous to talk to your neighbor. No, you moved a whole new country. Okay, and you're struggling with the language a little bit. So they go there, and someone comes from the soldiers of the king, knocks on the door or whatever avenue, asking for the Muslims, the king wants to speak to you. La ilaha illallah. What in the world is going to happen now? The Muslims, they gather, they huddle up. Okay? How many are they roughly, roughly speaking, the maximum number they reached, because they emigrated multiple times, was 80 men and 19 women, approximately. So a total, roughly, of 100 people gather up. What shall we do? What shall we say? So look very carefully and listen very carefully to what they said. Ready? And this is one of the main highlights of the story. Are you guys with me? So what will Jafar say? Because Jafar is a spokesperson. 
we got to make sure, does he say, I'm asking, does he say, we got to make sure what we say, and we got to make sure, like, anything, you know, uh, might cause us problems, we will t twist it, sugarcoat it, to accommodate, you know, we don't want to get deported, people, I'm not going to lose my green card, I mean, I'm not going to lose my stay here, you know what I mean, I don't I know people to take my, our passport, or whatever, whatever it takes, okay, you know what they said, La. they said, Wallahi naqul ma alimna. we will say what we learned, we will say what Allah said and what the Prophet said. Allahu Akbar. Kainan ma kan. Whatever the consequences may be, we will say it with respect and with dignity. May Allah grant us such strength. Say Ameen. Let me tell you something. You know that thing is, uh, I will do whatever Allah and the Prophet has told us. It's said by millions, maybe even billions. Are you with me? But the ones that do what Allah said and the Prophet said are very few. May Allah make us among the few. Say Ameen. So let's put this to the test. Jafar is the spokesperson. How old is he? He's approximate, I'm saying very approximate, 20 years old. Who is with him? Amongst the narration suggests that Uthman bin Affan is with him, who is the son-in-law of the Prophet, who married the daughter of the Uqayya there. And Allah knows best. As Jafar comes, the advisors and the people said, hey, how come you did not what? Prostrate, right? How come you did not prostrate to the king? Because it's a long walk. It's like a red carpet. So Jafar, with respect, says, لا نسجد إلا لله. We do not prostrate to no one but Allah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. May Allah allow us to submit only to Allah. Say Ameen. So then, by the way, if you get tested like that, you pass the test, FYI, for your information, the next test usually is more difficult. But it's also more what? Rewarding. May Allah grant you all great rewards. Say Ameen. So as they're coming, Amr bin Al-As, one of the guys who's so nervous, he wants to do whatever it takes for the Muslims what? Not to speak. He tells the king, see, I told you, bunch of losers. See, they walked all the way here. Look, did they prostrate to you? Disrespect. Disrespect. Anything. Just stop them. Just do whatever it takes. So Jafar comes. The king asks, how come you guys did not prostrate? Why do you not prostrate to me in greeting? You know what happens sometimes? We go through a small test, we pass. The next test, we just drop, right? Like, no, this is too much, right? The king eye to eye. Why did you not prostrate to me? Jafar repeats it. He says, لا نسجد إلا لله. We do not prostrate to no one but Allah. The king respected that. Keep going. So he king asked them, listen you guys. What is it that you guys believe in that made you let go of your families back home and you followed a religion not like mine or theirs and a whole new religion. What in the world is your story? So now Jafar, what will he do? The son of Abu Talib is to present his case. Now a question to you guys. I said this in the khutbah, we'll say it again. When you stand in front of a king in general or a president or anyone, how much time some of us can have a citizen to a president? If you're lucky, five minutes in a way, right? Whatever the case may be. Do you have a three hour session? Almost impossible, right? So in about five minutes or so, you will speak to someone about Islam. He or she are all ears. So what do you have to say? What would we say, right? Some people would get nervous. Will we say, uh, well, let me tell you, okay, let me talk about Islam. Like Islam is like peace. And um, it's, well, it feels so good. Like, like, wallah, like, like okay, listen. Like, okay, just repeat after me, Ashhadu, Ashhadu. Like, what do you mean? Like, take them, take them back to Mecca, right? So, how will you present Islam? May Allah grant us all wisdom. Say, I mean, it's not easy, by the way, it's not easy. You know, sometimes I would stand, talk about Islam to some people, and Allah, I get nervous. May Allah make it easier for all of us. May Allah educate us. So, what will he say? What will he say? Ready, guys? This is Jafar's plea. Look what he says. Six parts to it, inshallah. You can divide it differently, but I divide it to six parts. Number one. He will talk about the backwardness of his society. He says to the king, Ayyuhal Malik, O king, look at the respect. Not come by for, hey, yo, Najashi, what's up? Nah. Malik, Najashi, respect the status. That's what the prophet ta told us. People of a status, you respect, you call them. The guy spent 15 years becoming a doctor. It's painful. Call him doctor so and so, okay? May Allah make it easy on the doctor. Say I mean. All right. So the point being, Ayyuhal Malik, O king. We were a group of backward people. Oh, horrible. We used to worship idols, rocks, which we made with our own hands. 
We had no respect to family. We were horrible neighbors. We ate filthy food, decaying flesh, and we committed so many filthy things with the opposite gender and much more. And we had no justice system. The oppressor always oppresses the weak and no justice system is applicable to return the rights back to the ones who are wrong. That's one. Got it? You see what he did? Shows how miserable, how backward the society of his time. Number two, until a man whom we know, so he's talking about the greatness of the messenger, until a man whom we know, his level of truthfulness, level of honesty, level of modesty, level of trustworthiness, he came from amongst us. Okay, and then what? He came with a beautiful message. His message was obligations. You got to worship Allah alone. You got to submit fully to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to stress on this point very much. When we talk about Islam, you don't have to... Many times we overcome that statement. Number one is the worship of Allah. Number one is that forehead on the floor to Allah Jalla Jalalu. Don't go and talk on this and talk about that. Number one, every prophet that came, what did they say? Allah. Yes or no? That's the first thing that came from their mouth. Submit to Allah. Submit to Allah. Submit to Allah. Submit to Allah. Then everything else follows. Yes or no? May Allah grant us wisdom. So number one, He obligated us to worship none but Allah. To pray to Allah. To give in charity, to be good to our neighbors, to be good to our families, to such and such and such. And he prohibited us from committing fornication. He prohibited us from stealing the money of the orphans. He told us not to have false testimony. And he told us to never accuse respected women of very horrible acts. May Allah protect us. After he mentioned the greatness of the messenger and the greatness of the message, he says, as a result, we believed. We believed. So we followed what the Prophet told us to do, and we followed what the Prophet told us not to do. Fantastic. And then where's the problem? When we did that, we were persecuted due to what? Our belief. He says, these people, now he points at Amr, huh? Amr and the people, عذبونا, they tortured us, they persecuted us, they tried to ruin us. They tried to force us to leave this faith. As a result of the persecution, look what he will say the last. We sought safety under you, and najashi Allahu Akbar. We sought safety under you. And we are hopeful that when we are in your presence, that we will be respected. We will be people who are able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ayyuhal Malik. O King. Done. How was that? Fantastic job, mashallah, tabarakallah. May Allah grant us the strength of Ja'far. Say ameen. May Allah allow us to see Ja'far in Jannah. What will, ready? What will Ja'far be asked? Pay attention, brothers and sisters. The king asks something from the Prophet Sallallahu What do I mean? He asks Ja'far, do you have anything from revelation? Because Najashi knows. You say he's a prophet, so he receives what? Revelation. Do you have anything off top of your head that you can read? Ja'far says, Naam, I do have something to read for you. Now what will Ja'far read? What will Ja'far read? Something to truly appreciate. And that's when the wisdom comes again. I gave the example today. Check this out. An example. A husband, not husband, a man and a woman about to get married. Many times people say, brother so and so, can you please read Quran as an opening before the marriage takes place, right? Nothing wrong with that, inshallah, Allah knows best. Let's move on. So then, what does the brother do sometimes? They use verses, they read chapters. They're like, not in the right time and right place. But this is Quran, brother. I know it's Quran, brother, but that's the right time. So the brother says, and when he divorces her, <laughs> bro, they're not even married yet. <laughs> right? So there's wisdom. So what will the Prophet, when he told the Sahaba, what was that chapter that was re revealed before they left? Surat Maryam. And then he began to recite from chapter number 19, titled Maryam or Virgin Mary, and the brother will read a few verses for us, inshallah. Go ahead. إذ نادى ربه نداء خفيا قال رب إني وهن 
الحظم مني واشتعل الرأس شيبا ولم أكن بدعائك رب شرقيا وإني خفت الموالي من ورائي وكانت امرأتي عاقرا فهبني من لدنك وليا يرثني ويرث من آل يعقوب واجعله رب رضيا so Ja'far kept reading and reading and reading and reading. What do you think the reaction was of an Najashi? Brothers and sisters, an Najashi sitting on his throne, on his seat, he started to cry. An Najashi started to cry. He cried so much so the authentic narrations say that his beard became wet. Not just an Najashi cried, the scholars whom he invited to come, they cried. Those who know the scriptures and know the religion, they cried until the scripts became wet. Brothers and sisters, it's another lesson of the Qur'an. There's no way out of it. The Qur'an softened the hearts of the hardest of hearts. The Qur'an softened the heart of Umar. Yes or no, we spoke about it. The Qur'an softened the heart of Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. And the Qur'an can soften your heart and my heart. And no matter what type of heart that you have, you're like, bro, I have a hard time crying. I have a hard time feeling mercy. Whatever heart you have, the best of solution is nothing but the Quran. May Allah soften our hearts and not make it hard like rocks. Ameen, Rabbil Alameen. So Najashi cried and Najashi cried and look to what he says. He says, whatever you are saying is exactly in line to what the previous prophets have said including Jesus and Moses, Allahu Akbar. This is exact same wording. So then, an Najashi said, listen, listen you guys, Amr and the crew from Mecca, take your gifts and go back to Mecca. As for you, you will always be safe in my place. And whoever harms you, whoever talks bad about you, gharim, I will punish them. You practice your religion with absolute freedom, do as you wish, do as you were commanded by your prophet. And then at this point, Amr, without a doubt, was so humiliated. And he went back to Mecca with humility. The Muslims stayed in Abyssinia with complete dignity. Yes or no, brothers and sisters? May Allah protect us, Amir Rabbil Alameen. And that's something for all of us to appreciate. This happens in this life and will happen in the afterlife. You hold steadfast your deen. You're like, bro, people will make fun of me. People will do such and such to me. But no one, brothers and sisters, elevates or humiliates except Allah. Are you guys with me? So may Allah elevate all of you. But wallah, you will never be elevated. And I swear by Allah, I swear that Allah will hold me accountable for. You will never be elevated when you disrespect Allah. It just doesn't happen. One plus one equals two. That's how it works, brothers and sisters. And never, never will you be humiliated when you respect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't be con very concerned about the people. Wallahi, the world as a whole, there's a lot of goodness around the people. I shared that in the khutbah and I'll share it here and end that segment of Abyssinia. People respect when you hold your principles. May Allah protect us and grant us sincerity. Say Ameen. I told them that I traveled one time from Detroit to Atlanta. And I was sitting in the middle seat. May Allah be with everybody who sits in the middle seat. Ameen. Okay. I sat in the middle seat and then one of the flight attendants, they, she came and they were passing asking what you, would you like to drink and what would you like to eat? And usually when I travel, I would to pass whatever, uh, I'm in the aisle, like here you go, mister, here you go, ma'am, whatever. But this time the lady asked for two items. She asked, can I have seven up? I'm like, khair. The second thing she asked, can I have some alcohol? I'm like, la hawla wa Seven up, here you go. Alcohol? I can't. So I did this. So then she extended her hand, like half haram, like the elbow is hitting me or whatever. And then she grabbed it, right? So then she placed the alcohol and she grabbed it. It's an old lady. So she tried to grab the bottle and she tried to open it. I'm like, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Wallahi brothers, and you guys wouldn't know, we don't have to swear. If it was anything, we will open it, right? Any one of you will open it. But it's alcohol. So then she turns to me, I'm like, Ya Rabbi, and Wallahi Shuf, I'll, t I, I'll tell you something very honest. Lecturing is one thing. Applying it is a whole nother thing. 
right? From one test, I can fail. Like, Brother Majid, you, Wallahi, mashallah. Wallahi, mashallah. Just make dua for your brother. Just make dua for me, inshallah. And may Allah conceal every one of us. Say, Ameen. So I'm like, like excuse me, sir. Uh, would you mind if you can uh, open the bottle? I said, I'm so sorry. Some of you are like, brother, don't say, be an unapologetic Muslim. Jazakallah khair. I'm not that strong yet. Okay, I'm working on it. Okay, so I told that person, I am so sorry, but I won't be able to open this bottle of alcohol. He's like, okay. And she tried again, she tried again. Then she looked at the one who was on the aisle. So remember, she's in the window seat, I'm in the middle, and there's a guy on the aisle. And he was watching college football, putting some big headphones. So she said, excuse me, sir. I don't want to even contribute. Excuse me, she wants to talk. To no, no, I don't want to. Excuse me, sir. Then he took his headphone. Yes. Would you mind opening the bottle for me? The guy looked at me. <laughs> what is this guy doing? Right? And you know what's really bad? Is I was working on the lecture. <laughs> the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it was just, it was just, and the whole package was like fitna, trial and tribulation. And you, Allah, sometimes you feel like, bro, let me just, let's all just drink together, khalas. You know what I mean? It's tough, right? It's, may Allah grant us sincerity. See what I mean? So I, I didn't co contribute and I continued working my lecture. Then as we were about to land, I'm like, I have to explain myself. So I told the lady, I'm like, listen, I'm very sorry if you were offended by me not being able to open the alcohol bottle and stuff like that. I told her, I would do whatever you want. I'll open whatever bottle it is, but just not alcohol. I can't grab it, I can't hold it, I can't pass it. I'll carry your luggage. I went as far as saying, I'll even walk, clean your shoes for you. I don't have no problem with that. But alcohol, I can't go that far. I hope you were not offended. You know what she said? And wallahi, it shook me. She said, actually, I was very proud of you. Really? This whole time, sort of said it, yani. I'm like nervous. She's like, actually, I'm very proud of you. You know, as awkward as the situation was, you held tight your principles. I'm like, oh, thank you. But you know what pained me? Is I should have felt a little more dignified, a little more comfortable without me having to hear that. Yes or no? So may Allah grant us strength. Say, Amin. So things will happen throughout your life like that. And Jafar said, we don't prostrate to no one but Allah. Jafar and his people said, we will say whatever it is with respect, not at the expense of disrespecting Allah. Allahu Akbar. And that's what they did, brothers and sisters. And the Muslims remained in peace and dignity in Abyssinia. And the people of Quraysh went back. Brothers and sisters, Quraysh was angry. Quraysh was furious. Why? I'm giving you a quick recap. Are you guys with me, inshallah? May Allah make it easy for all of us. It's a packed session, packed. Packed night, then a good night, inshallah. Good night. You're gonna have a very good night's sleep, inshallah. When they came back to Mecca, huh? What happened? Why are you where's the Muslims? We couldn't. So now they settled in Abyssinia? Yes, they did. So now they found a shelter, a home, and the people of Quraysh were so angry. Why? Muslims found a shelter in Abyssinia under an Najashi. This adds strength to the proof of prophethood. Yes or no? The Prophet said, no one is oppressed in his presence. This adds affirmation to people. He is a prophet. This is an unseen situation. Then, Muslims are increasing in number. Not just any Muslims. We have some really influential people accepting Islam. Such as Umar. And guess who else joined? Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib. Hamza, why is he so special that you named him like that? Hamza is the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. Hamza was very physically strong. Hamza was so influential. Hamza, people think two, three, five, ten times before talking to him and getting him angry. Hamza was a hunter. Hamza was someone who you see him in the gym all the time. That's the type of man he was. He also joined the crew. He became part of the Muslims. So they said, people of Quraysh, listen up. Enough is enough. We will make one of the last offers to Abu Talib, the uncle of who? The Prophet ﷺ, to try to get the situation settled. Ready for the offer? Ready? They went to Abu Talib. He said, listen, you know what your nephew is doing. Chaos. You see what's happening. We don't have to go into detail. Hand us this man. Let some unknown person come and kill him. Why unknown? Because if they kill him, then the revenge comes from the family of the Prophet. It's a big, big family. Bani Hashim, Bani Muttalib. Two big families and the Arab are all about revenge, right? So just some unknown person, whatever the case is. Abu Talib said, no way. Impossible. I will never hand you Muhammad, my nephew. They said, we will give you whatever money in the world that you want. He said, no, I will not give Muhammad away. Allahu Akbar. May Allah not make us get Muhammad away from us. Say, I mean, brother, he's dead. No. 
That's not the point. What I'm saying is may Allah not make us be away from His life. May Allah not make us be away from practicing him, his, way, his way of behaving in our life footstep by footstep, Amir Rabbil Alameen. May Allah forgive us for how far we are from imitating him, yes or no? May Allah forgive us, both men and women. So Abu Talib, who's not a Muslim, said, I'm not going to hand Muhammad to you. He loved Muhammad, his nephew, wonderful man. So when Abu Talib heard that, Abu Talib got nervous. It just makes sense. You guys are going as far as trying to kill him in my presence? Like, you actually offered me that? So Abu Talib talks to his two tribes, and he's the leader. Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib. What's the matter, uncle? We need to gather. We need to protect Muhammad. We need ultimate security 24-7. Okay? Okay, they gathered. When Quraysh, they saw that, they got even angrier. So you will not just not hand us Muhammad, you will give him such security and protection, no way will we accept that. So the people, besides the two tribes, what were they? Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib, besides these two tribes, all the tribes, they gathered and do what? Boycott. We will boycott against Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib. To what extent? What do you mean boycott? To what level? We will have no business transaction. We will not buy anything from them and we will not sell anything from them. Back and forth. Not just that. Any family relations. Marriages, anything in the... Okay, they're engaged. No, cut the marriage. It's over. That's how my filth... May Allah protect us. Boyka, boyka. These are your... This is your blood family. You see how Jafar said, we have no respect to family. You see that? Who does not have respect to family? Is it the Muslims or them? Are you guys with me? They say, oh, such and such, the Muslims are the terrorists. Yes or no? Who's the real terrorist? Right? They just label whoever they want. Oh, you guys, you cut families. Who just ruined marriages? Was it not you? May Allah protect us and forgive us. Say Ameen. May Allah grant us clarity. And not just sight. May Allah grant us insight. Ameen, Rabbil Alameen. So they boycotted. Abu Talib was nervous. So he withdrew. Banu Hashim, Banu Muttalib into a valley. A valley is a tight space. We don't trust these people anymore. We don't trust them. We go to a valley. And we will protect Muhammad Sallallahu Who joined the valley? Muslims and non-Muslims from these two tribes. The Muslims joined due to their faith. The non-Muslims joined due to tribalism and culture and ethnicity and so on and so forth. Are you guys with me? The Muslims, they did not love their people. Oh, they loved them. But there's a higher intention. Are you guys with me? There's what? A higher intention. I'm doing it for God's sake. So the better your intention, the more reward that you get. Yes. If now this clicker falls and our respected brother gives me the clicker, I pray to Allah, he will reward him. He might have not thought, I will pick up the clicker for the sake of God to pass it down to you. Oh God, reward me. He didn't have that process. We believe Allah will reward him, right? It's, a, it's done out of goodwill. That's the key. But if he is able to manage to do this for the sake of God, they get more reward for that. Are you guys with me? Yes, passing a cup of water to your respected, beautiful parent will get you lots of rewards. You pass that cup of water, keeping in mind Allah told me to serve them, regardless of what they do to an extent, Allah rewards you even more. Fair enough? So the Muslims, when they entered, Allah gave them, inshallah, hopefully optimistic, maximum reward. The non-Muslims, whatever reward they get is in this life and not in the afterlife. Fair enough? All within the, what the scholars have said, and authentic narrations. You know what the people of Quraysh thought? They believed, and this is true, when we starve you, your mind becomes paralyzed. Yes or no? When we starve you, your mind becomes paralyzed. And I've seen it just last week. A mom calls up. She, I was there, and her son was acting in a very disrespectful way. Very disrespectful. Yelling at his mom, and I just couldn't believe what happened. Then the mom said, please talk to him. It's just in front of everybody. It's like public. So I said to the brother, come here, come here. So I took the brother. We went to a restaurant. I sat with him. What just happened? He said, you know what? I think I was way too hungry. You know when he said that? After he was full. Before he was angry, I didn't ask him. He's very angry. We went, we ate. After he filled his stomach, he said, I think I was very, very hungry. You see that? Many times, this is a solution to many problems, okay? After this, you go have dinner as a family, inshallah. Okay? No, but with wisdom, with balance. Are you guys with me? 
So the point being as simple as, and he went back and I spoke to the parent. He was like, Mama, I'm so sorry. I just, I think I was hungry and stuff. She's like, okay, then make sure you eat before you talk to me. You know, stuff, stuff like that. Anyhow, but that level of hunger that he had is nowhere near that hunger. Are you guys with me? The Muslims, we have no problem feeling hungry. We have no problem feeling thirsty. We have no problem, our souls, for it to leave our body and we will not make you touch Muhammad Sallallahu Allahu Akbar. Wallahi, not just touch, let alone hand him to you. Let us die, let the soul leave the body, let the blood be shed all over the place. Let the babies cry, let the women and the elders struggle, all of them and men. We will never hand Muhammad to you. Allah, may Allah grant us such dignity with respect and wisdom. So when they did that, how long? A day, two, six months, no more. Are you serious? A year, go more. Two years, go. Some of the scholars, they estimate it was about three years. The Prophet ﷺ entered into the siege or the boycott when he was about 47 years old. And he's about to leave that boycott. That three years, he's about 50 years old. What happened? Brothers and sisters, many struggled. Babies were crying at night. You know who was the only guy from Banu Hashim who was not there? One guy. One loser. Abu Lahab. The only guy from Banu Hashim didn't join them. I'm going to go with others. Was Abu Lahab. That's why we teach it to our kids. Tabbat yada Abi Lahab in Watab. Yes or no? All of us should know this surah. Tabbat yada. May his hands perish. You know why? Because he used to go to business people that come from outside Mecca. And the Muslims, they go to them to buy because they are not part of that boycott. Are you guys with me? Outside salespeople. So then Abu Lahab would to go to them. Listen, don't sell the items to these people. From Banu Hashim, Banu Muttalib. What do you mean? I'm coming here to sell my products and then go back to my country. Go back to my city. Listen, you know how rich I am. Yes or no? Yeah. I guarantee you, you'll be sold out. I guarantee you. When they come, don't sell it. Are you serious? Don't sell it. I'll give you more money than you expected. Okay, Muslims come starving, starving. And then, can you please buy this? Uh, I can't sell that to you. And if they do want to sell, what do they do? Give an outrageous price. You want this? Give me a thousand gold coins, as an example. So the Muslims struggled more and more. Some narrations suggest, and as I told you from the beginning of the, of the ser series till this day, any time I mention Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu it's based on authentic narration, inshallah. Are you guys with me? Specifically. Some other narrations that talk about the companions, some of them had to eat tree leaves grass to survive that the narration say that when they use the bathroom excuse me the body extracts waste the way the animals extract their waste may Allah forgive us and protect us even one narration said that Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas at night time he wanted to use the bathroom and urinate as he was urinating the sound was not hitting with all due respect just to appreciate their struggle seemed different so he said that I went down and I saw what's on the ground, and it was a skin of an animal. I washed it up, put it on the fire to clean it, to kill whatever bacteria, whatever germs, etc. Then I ate, and I drank a little bit of water, and I survived on these two for three days. That's the level of life that they had. And not one, open up the books that I'm aware of. Who here said, you know what, just take Muhammad, it's over. No! Wallahi, once again I say it, make us thirsty, make us hungry, let the souls leave our body, we will not surrender Muhammad to you. We will not let go of that faith, may Allah make us strong, say Ameen. Hatta halak man halak, what does it mean? Until one after the other died, and Muhammad will not be surrendered. And you have to also appreciate how the non-Muslims were there. They had that love. So what we're saying is that keep that love, but transition that love and love the Creator who gave you that strength, yes or no? So next time, you know what this shows me and shows you? You can do it. Are you guys with me? Like, I don't see myself being able to read Quran for 10 minutes. You spent an hour and 10 minutes on Twitter and social media, so you can do 10 minutes Quran. Are you guys with me? You have the capacity. You have the capacity. I don't see myself fasting. What do you mean? Do you not do this whole intermittent fasting, 10 hours a day and stuff like that? And like, yeah, yeah, I do that, mashallah. Tayyib, that means you can fast as well. Are you guys with me? To an extent. Oh, I can't stand this long. I can't do that. You do it throughout your whole life. What do we do? I can't really help my mom. She asks for different things. You know what she goes, says, go throw the garbage out. Go upstairs. Go downstairs. 
Bro, are you not trying out for track and field? <laughs> yes or no? Are you not going for track and field? You're struggling with the stairs? Do you not bench press 250 pounds? So you can do it. You can pull the garbage bin and take it on a Sunday or Monday, whatever your garbage day is. Are you guys with me? So we, we appreciate what the non-Muslims are doing. The reward, Allah will give it to them in this world. But nothing for them in the afterlife. May Allah grant us the best. No sugar coating. May Allah grant us wisdom. Say Ameen. So when this happened, brothers and sisters, an internal argument took place. I'll summarize it. An internal argument amongst two of them. No, 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 no. Amongst the other tribes. Some of them felt bad. How can we do this to our cousins? How can we do that to our people? How is it possible? Enough is enough. Abu Jahl said, no, we'll keep it back and forth until eventually the whole boycott fell apart and the people broke apart and the whole boycott was completely lifted. Are you guys with me? Now the Prophet is how old roughly? Three years later, 50 years old. But brothers and sisters, calamity upon calamity. What do you mean? Calamity upon calamity. May Allah grant you all Jannah, say Ameen. Rasulullah Sallam, calamity upon calamity. Left that boycott, but brothers and sisters, very sad. What happened? Abu Talib, roughly, roughly 80 years old. Left that siege, was very tired, was very exhausted. His health was no longer as strong as it used to be. Abu Talib was on his deathbed, brothers and sisters. The Prophet Sallallahu when he realized that, the one who is the external support, the one who was standing next to the Prophet all life long, since he was young, yes or no? Since he was young, the Prophet was faithful, didn't ignore him. He came to his uncle. What does he want? As he came in, guess who he found? He found Abu Jahl. He found Abu Jahl there. So the Prophet came, sat next to Abu Talib. He says, uncle, ya am, uncle. Qul la ilaha illallah. Say la ilaha illallah. I beg you. Say, say, there's no deity worthy of worship but Allah. Say it. The believers amongst us, say la ilaha illallah. Say la ilaha illallah. Say alhamdulillah. Wallahi, that ability to say la ilaha illallah, had you think so much about it, it will make you cry. Yes or no? Say alhamdulillah. Abu Talib is struggling. Abu Talib hears, the Prophet says, say la ilaha illallah. The Prophet says, if you say that, oh uncle, I will do whatever it takes to hook you up. I will hook you up, ya maqiyam. I will talk to Allah. I will do whatever it takes. I will do anything in my capacity. To help you out. Because Abu Talib throughout his whole life, he didn't really pray or he didn't really do stuff of Islam, yes or no? So the Prophet tells him, I'll do whatever it takes. And, do, and yes, conversion to Islam erases the past, but the Prophet wants to even go further. Abu Jahl says, Abu Talib, atargabu an millati Abdul Muttalib? Abu Talib, he's not even addressing the Prophet, you see that? Abu Talib, are you going to let go of what your parents taught you? Are you going to let go of what your father, Abdul Muttalib, taught you about worshipping idols? And they both went back and forth to Abu Talib. Ya am, uncle, please say la ilaha illallah. Please, I will do whatever I can to help you after that. This is the key. If you don't say, uncle, I cannot help you whatsoever. I'm a prophet, I can't help you whatsoever. You have to open up the door and I will go all out. Just say it, la ilaha illallah. Abu Jahl says, Abu Talib, are you going to let go of the religion of your forefathers? The Prophet is being devastated. It's taking way too long. Uncle, uncle, say la ilaha illallah, I beg you. Abu Jahl, steadfast. Just like how the Prophet is steadfast. He tells Abu Talib, will you let go of the religion of your forefathers? Back and forth, brothers and sisters, you face that almost every single day. You have someone that tells you to do that which is right, and someone else tells you that which is wrong. Yes or no? It happens in one way or another. One post as you go through your news feed says, go to that event, corruption. And the other one says, go to that event, construction. Yes or no? Things that will weaken your faith, things that will strengthen it. May Allah strengthen our faith. Say, Ameen. Struggling. Say, La ilaha illallah. Uncle, please, with respect. And by the way, you're talking about who? Prophet Muhammad. What does it mean? Gentleness. Yes or no? What does it mean? Wisdom. What does it mean? The most eloquent. Yes or no? It just can't get any better. And it also can't get any worse. Abu Jahl is on the other side. Abu Talib concludes with two statements. You guys ready? This is authenticity. He says two things. Number one, he looks at his nephew, Muhammad He looks, and I'm sure he loves him more than you can imagine. He says, if it wasn't that the people will criticize me, that now I am on my deathbed, now I am weak. Now I got nothing to lose. And that's why 
I said no deity worthy of worship but Allah, la ilaha Allah. If it wasn't for that and people's criticism, la akrartu biha I would have said it and I would have known it would have made you happy. Then he says, so I choose to die upon the religion of my forefathers. And that was the last thing that he said, I will die upon the religion of my forefathers, which is idol worshipping. The Prophet ﷺ, what sadness you want to talk about? What tears you want to talk about? What broken heart you want to talk about? And much more. That's how he felt. So then the Prophet ﷺ was so sad, brothers and sisters. And he narrated to us that Abu Talib, an authentic narration, one after the other, he's in hellfire. He's in hellfire. The all the good. What did I tell you at the beginning of the session? La ilaha illallah opens the key, then the rest comes inshallah. Anything else, it will stop. May Allah grant us Jannah. Say Ameen. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says he will go to hell. And one of his uncle asked him, Muhammad, how will you benefit your uncle now? After all what he did to you. He said the best I can do for him is, get, is assist him in a way that I will speak to God in a way to have my uncle Abu Talib have the minimum punishment in hellfire. And the minimum punishment in hellfire, the absolute minimum, it doesn't get any easier than that. That's the minimum, is they will be wearing sandals or they will be standing on rocks that are so hot that it boils the brains. And that's what Abu Talib will go through. May Allah grant you all Jannah, Mirabal Alameen. And why do we say that? Because the Prophet ﷺ said that. Are you guys with me? It's not emotional, it's not something, oh, it's painful. But brothers and sisters, this is one thing. You know who else is struggling? You know who else was in so much pain? Was Khadija anha. And we will end with that. Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her. The strongest internal support. The external is gone, the internal. Ah, oh, Khadija. Right before his eyes, always with Rasulullah ﷺ. She's struggling, Khadija radiallahu anha. Khadija, the one who was known as the pure and the modest before Islam. Khadija, the first one to say, La ilaha illallah. Yes or no? The first one to say, La ilaha illallah. Khadija, the first one to pray behind Rasulullah. Yes or no? Khadija radiallahu anha, the one who spent her money on her husband when others neglected him. Khadija, the first to believe in him when others rejected him. Khadija, the one that strengthened him when others sought to weaken him. Khadija, last few breaths. Khadija is struggling and Khadija dies right in front of Rasulullah wasallam. And this is just calamity upon calamity. What in the world is going on? People start questioning God, yes or no? Why is this happening to me? But the Prophet is far, far away from that. And brothers and sisters, I pray to Allah to allow every woman and every man to be like Khadija radiallahu anha. And I want to end on a very sad note like that. No, no, I'm not into that type of, no. Because with every pain, there's pleasure. No, 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 that's incorrect, brother. That's just, you're right, I'm incorrect. With every pain, more pleasure comes in magnitude than the pain you experience. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى With every hardship, there's two E's, multiple E's. Before Khadija died, brothers and sisters, Jibreel came to the Prophet. Are you guys with me? I, don't want, I want your undivided attention. May Allah grant you all Jannah. Jibreel comes to the Prophet ﷺ at his house. O Prophet of Allah, Khadija is about to walk in. She's holding a plate of food. When Khadija comes, tell her that Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, Allah, the creator who's under him are billions, billions of creation. Allah specifies a special greeting for Khadija. Allahu Akbar. And Ya Rasulullah Muhammad, tell Khadija that Allah send his salam to her and tell her that I also say salam and I greet her as well. Lo and behold, who walks in? Khadija with food. Revelation from Allah. Nothing is surprising, yes or no? Revelation from above seven heavens. He can see everything. Khadija walks in with food. The Prophet says, Khadija, guess what? What? Jibreel just came over. Jibreel? Jibreel came over and told me to tell you something. He told me to tell you that Allah sends a special greeting to you. Allahu Akbar. And Jibreel says salam to you. And then he says, and Jibreel, before he left, he told me something. Ready for this one? Wabashirha, ayya Muhammad, tell Khadija something that awaiting her in paradise is a palace made out of a pearl. A palace made out of a pearl. 
when she gets into that palace in paradise, there's no fatigue and there's no noise. Why? Khadija heard so much noise in this life. Khadija, people mocked her that she has no boys. Yes or no? Inna shani'aka huwa al-abta. They mocked that the lineage of these two will end. Especially Muhammad, it will end. She heard so much noise. People talking trash about her and her family. Yes or no? And so much fatigue. Was she not in the siege? Was she not with the Prophet? But when she goes in Jannah, no fatigue, no noise. So Khadija says, look at her scholarly level. Are you guys with me? She does not say, and peace be upon God. No. She said, God is peace. That's her response. Allah, who was salam? Then she says, and may peace be upon Jibreel. And look at the respect. And may peace be upon you, O Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And that's one of the last things that Khadija went through. What in the world will happen to the Prophet? Abu Talib is dead. And persecution escalates like never before. We'll talk about more details, inshallah. May Allah grant you all Jannah. May Allah allow to you Khadija. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>